Jungle Deep, 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 the podcast that explores the tropical lifestyle. Hello, and welcome to the podcast, Jungle Deep. This is your host, Dr. Jones. We are on safari, and I'm here with you to learn, to have fun, and to explore the jungle. love for the forest. What can we learn from it about how to live? Today's episode is called Jungle Lifestyle, as we have a conversation about the elements of a healthy life inspired by living among the trees. Our guest today is a model for all young people, an inspiration by simply how he chooses to live, close to the earth. Mickey Mittermeier. Mick is a 20-year-old college student who has already traveled to 64 countries and mostly to tropical regions in pursuit of endangered exotic animals, special places known as biodiversity hotspots. These safaris included Australia, Indonesia, Suriname, East Africa, and Madagascar, and many, many others. He has had this wonderful opportunity because his father is the noted primatologist and president of Conservation International, Dr. Russ Mittermeier. While his scientist father has been away from home most of his youth, Mick often went with his father on surveys of endangered species. As you will hear, Mick credits his father with his adventurous spirit, love of the wild, his scientific curiosity, and his love for Tarzan. Mick describes the impact of Tarzan books upon his life as profound. His reading of most of the 24 Tarzan book inspires Mick to go out and explore places that he calls far away, primal, wild, untouched, savage, dangerous, and cool. He says that different people take away something a little different from the Tarzan character. For Mick's dad, Russ, it was conservation, protection of the wild. For Mick, it has been fitness and natural health. In addition to his world travels for conservation and studies in anthropology in college, Mick promotes a new sport he calls free tree climbing. This is climbing trees without the aid of ropes, pulleys, gloves, and high-tech shoes. Rather, climbing trees like Tarzan did it. Recent health movements known as MoveNat, for Move Naturally, and the Paleo Diet, Promote exercise based on barefoot running, throwing, climbing, swimming, carrying, and eating naturally. All healthful behaviors rooted in our human past. Mickey is taking it to the trees. He says, people think it's weird, but I think it's fantastic. Revealing his appealing confidence, he adds, I just have to teach them. He does not believe in common gym workout regimens, protein shakes, pills, and even hormones, but in a natural way to fitness. One that works with your natural biology rather than trying to manipulate it through using machines and chemistry. Mick's attitude is like a breath of fresh tropic air. Let's listen in on this conversation with Mick Mittermeier. We're going to say hello. Mick, are you there? I am. I I can't hear you. Hi. I'm so pleased you're with us to talk about these topics. It seems that you are quite a Tarzan enthusiast yourself. Oh, absolutely. Before we talk about that, tell us just a little bit about yourself, your, where you're going to school and your major and that kind of thing. What are you up to these days? Hi, well, uh, hi everyone. I'm Mickey Mittermeier. I'm uh, 20 years old, and I attend Eckerd College down in St. Petersburg, Florida. Currently, I'm trying to pursue a major in either cultural or biological anthropology, either focusing on different cultures around the world, ethnographies, or perhaps uh you know, human anatomy and the, and the body with biological anthropology, but I'm, uh, I'm still working on it. and I try and follow my father's footsteps. 
Yeah, I understand. He was an anthropology major. Yeah, yeah. Like most of the men in my family, we started out kind of following biology in uh, university, and then we all switched off into different fields. My my brother with history, and my father and I with book of anthropology. Well, I'm going to be asking about, in fact, I'm sure we're going to be talking about quite a bit about your personal passions, but before we go into any detail, just give, give us an idea of what those are. What what are some of your your interests? Now, well, my interest, if you heard the podcast with my father, that's pretty much pretty much the same as his. From a very early age, my uh, my dad's been, you know, inspiring inspiring me, my brother, and my sister, especially through through uh, things like like travel. Since I was about two years old, I've, I've been traveling. My dad, I remember, or my dad when I was two years old, took me to Australia, Indonesia, and Sulawesi, and I've been traveling with him ever since. About a month ago, I was in Estonia and Finland, up in the high Arctic, looking for wolves, bears, and wolverines. Huh. Yeah, that took me to my 64th country. I've been to 64 countries. Whoa, yeah. whoa, 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 wait, you, you're saying 64 countries? 64, it's, yeah, <laughs> it's Wow, <laughs> and I'm still now. That that's yeah, that's pretty amazing, Mick. Especially for someone just 20 years old. I I think you I'm, I'm you, still not the, you qualify. So. I'm still not beating anyone else <laughs> in my family. My my dad's at about 150, 155, 156. My brother's at 102, or 103. My sister's at 40 something. My oh, mom's at 80 something. Word. Yeah, it's 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 pretty it's a good. It's an interesting lifestyle. I really enjoy it. But uh. Has, that sounds yeah, it sounds awesome. But I mean, your family ought to. I mean, with all that travel, you guys, you you must own your own airline by now. <laughs> we might as we might as well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's amazing. So all this travel is generated in you a, a a passionate interest in in what exactly? Well, like I said, I've I've always grown around. I've I've grown up around you know several influences, mostly mostly of my my father and my mother. But but their interests have included you know obviously conservation hotspots, endangered species, indigenous cultures. Most of the travel I've done has actually been in tropical rainforests. And so one of the things that's inspired in me is, you know, conservation of these incredible hotspots areas that uh, still house some of the world's most diverse biodiversity, most diverse interesting animals, endangered species, and indigenous cultures. It's inspired in me a, a desire to, you know, protect those for future generations. How I'm going to do that is still a, a question, but... Uh, well, you know, it's definitely me you important. have some time yet. That's that's okay. I don't think you have to have all the plans and all the answers uh, uh, yet. You have some more exploring to do. But my goodness, you've seen a lot already. You're following in your your father's footsteps. It certainly sounds like that. Well, let me first uh, ask you then, uh, to, just to expand on that a little further. What is it like to have someone like Dr. Mittermeier as your father to be his son? I was going to suggest that he might be away a lot, but it sounds like he takes you with him a lot, too. He travels uh, a pretty hefty majority of the time. He's gone for a lot of the year. He's only home about maybe 20 or 25 percent of the year. But people would say that that's, you know, being a, being a bad father figure, just by no means at all. You know, he's taken me on so many amazing trips, and I've been to so many incredible places that people three times my age haven't been to and i've seen things that people just would not believe and that's completely altered the way that i look at the world like you know the way that i view the world and the people around me you know it's interesting it's like having an encyclopedia <laughs> there constantly just the the vast, the vast knowledge that he has is just it's incredible you know i've learned an immense amount from being exposed to that kind of stuff and, and i would definitely not be the person i am today if it had not been for those influences yeah, it sounds like some wonderful influences there. Well, I'm going to ask you to go a little further with that, see if you can tell us what, what might be some of the most remarkable things you have seen in the rainforest in your travels. Well, in the rainforest, I've been to, I think, tropical rainforest. Most of the travel that we do has been in South America, mostly in Amazon and in the Guyana Shield. We've also been a little bit in Africa. Well, I've been a little bit in Africa. Like I said, my travels, you know, in comparison to Russ's. So also in Southeast Asia, a little bit, Australia and Papua New Guinea and places like that. When I travel with my dad, we mostly go to go look for, uh, you know, really cool endangered species. And, you know, also it takes us on really interesting expeditions. I got to say some of the most, some of the best ones that I've been on have been in Amazon. I think one of my most, one of my most memorable experiences probably about two years ago when uh, we went into the Central Suriname Nature Reserve in the country of Suriname in North, northern South America and in between the in between the Guyanas. And the intention of that trip was to go find and climb an unclimbed mountain called the Van der White Top, which is a an Inselberg or a forest mountain. And that, that trip had a had a great impact on me because we were going into this pristine, untouched rainforest, going up through 
through rapids and through rivers and creeks and stuff and cutting through spending several days cutting through uh through untouched rainforest and finally getting to this to this mountain and it was uh an incredibly powerful experience because we were there we were the first people probably in recorded history and if not in recorded history or if not in, in you know history then definitely in the last few thousand years and i thought that was that was, that was very powerful for me it kind of brought to light the fact that many people think that, you know, the age of discovery and the age of exploration kind of ended with the explorers of the 19th and 20th century, like Wallace and Stanley and Livingston. Going on trips like that really brings to light the fact that there are still places on Earth that are untouched by globalization and are untouched by man and that they're still out there to find and explore. That's one of the things that's shown me and my siblings is that there's always great potential for exploration and that it's important to conserve those places. It seems that there's a real spirit of the explorer uh, very much uh, central to your, your family life. I imagine you could write some interesting books and tell quite a few tales. Tell us how all this started for you. Was Tarzan a, an early influence for you, like it was for your father? Like I said, this is something that I've been exposed to my entire life. I've been traveling on summer vacations, winter breaks, whenever I've had time since I was pretty much born, since I was a little kid. This great spirit of adventure also, you know, like you said, stemmed, uh, stemmed greatly from reading the Tarzan books. As I'm sure my dad told you, whenever he does interviews, he always says, you know, people go, oh, so what do you do what you do? And he says, I guess I just read too many Tarzan books when I was little. And I never really understood that until I started reading the books myself. The impact that they've had on me has been really profound. Like my, like my dad mentioned, probably when he was 10 years old, he was in the Babylon train station in New York, and his mom bought him, his mother bought him a copy of the book, Tarzan at the Earth's Core, which talks about the adventures of Tarzan of the Apes going to the lost world of Pellucidar, and the, you know, the Earth's core in the center of the world. And just what he does down there and how he explores and everything and, and battles dinosaurs and everything. And it's, it's an awesome story. I definitely recommend it. When each one of my siblings and I turned 10, he gave us a copy of that book, you know, a really old copy from 1916. We read them and I've read most of the Tarzan books myself. It just instilled in you a, a feeling of the primordial, a feeling of the uh, of the wild and the savage, and that that still exists in the world. That there's still places that are really wild and untouched and really dangerous and cool, and that you should go out there and explore. That you shouldn't be afraid to do that. And for my dad, it's had several uh, impacts. It's influenced him, like you probably mentioned, to continue to conserve and protect jungles and uh, the places that Tarzan would have protected. And for yourself, it sounds like that influence started for you around age 10, even though you'd already been doing some traveling. Yeah, absolutely. What I say is people get different influences from reading the Tarzan books. And unfortunately, you know, sadly, is that reading the books has kind of died out in this generation. It was something that's been more around in the earlier part of the last century. People, were, uh, people read Tarzan more, and he's one of the most highly reproduced cinema characters, so people know him a lot through movies. People have really forgotten the story of Tarzan, the real story of Tarzan. And so what I say is mm-hmm, people, mm-hmm. people get different inspirations from Tarzan. And what my father's inspiration was, here is this character, this hero that lives in the jungle and protects his jungle home and his friends and everyone that lives in the jungle from hunters and poachers and you know, people that want to go in and destroy it. For the most part, that, that's what he's done. When he was in first grade, his teacher asked him what he wanted to be when he grew up. And he said, I want to be a jungle explorer. And that's pretty much held true for him, which is interesting, <laughs> which, I, which has been inspirational for me as well. But the inspiration that I've gotten from reading the Tarzan books is more in regards to fitness. <laughs> when I read Tarzan, what I saw was this boy that grew up, this baby that grew up in the forest, went through young manhood and grew to be this strong, powerful, fearless character just as a result of living and behaving and eating and doing everything naturally, climbing trees, swimming, running barefoot. And what that's done for me is it evolved my... Uh, my views towards fitness. So currently what I do is I follow the natural fitness community with several important characters in that, such as Erwin LaCour, who's the founder of Movnat, Barefoot Ted McDonald, who is the founder of Luna Sandals, John Durant, who is spearheading the uh, paleo movement, paleo food in in places like New York City. Now, now, now we're going to have some listeners that don't know anything about that stuff. So just briefly give us a, a little overview of what those people are talking about what they're doing. What, what is MoveNet? Oh, right. Absolutely. MoveNet stands for uh, MoveNet Natural, which is natural movement. It was started by a man named Georges Herbert in the late 1800s, and he's someone who traveled extensively through continents like Africa and South America, and he, he saw indigenous cultures, indigenous people living in those natural environments, moving and behaving naturally, doing things like climbing and running and swimming and natural activities like that. And 
he also saw that these people were, as a result, incredibly fit and incredibly healthy and strong and able to do things like perform acrobatics and other amazing feats. And what it made him think was that why is it that people living in society, living in industrialized countries, are out of shape? And what he did was he went home with that knowledge back to France and he created the first natural movement school. It went a little, it went well for a little while, but then kind of flickered out until Erwin LaCour took it back up just a few years ago and he created Movnat. And Movnat follows the same basic principles. And for those who want more information about this, they can visit Movnat.com. That's M O V N A T dot com for a website about this kind of physical fitness. Okay, what about the others? You, you mentioned uh, the paleo movement. What's uh, get quickly, what's that about? A uh, paleo movement basically is talking about how pre-agricultural societies, hunter-gatherer societies that still exist in some places are much healthier than the ways of diet and fitness today because there's all sorts of examples. If you look around and, you know, see movies like Food Inc. or, you know, I remember that one about McDonald's that was uh, Super, super Size Me. It's these disgusting <laughs> right. examples how society has just evolved, how it's, like, di- digressed so, so, uh, so vastly from the original, like, hunter-gatherer kind of uh, lifestyle. I think a lot of us suffer from that and have a, an intuitive feeling about that. So who's teaching this paleo way of looking at things, and what is? tell us a little bit more about that movement and that formation. Movnat and, and paleo, they kind of go hand in hand. They're, they, uh, they're meshing. It's just, it's just basically preaching natural movements, that you don't need to go to a gym to be fit, and that doing those repetitious movements aren't necessarily good for the body. And moving naturally is actually the way we're supposed to do things, as well as eating naturally. Eating naturally, pre-agricultural, meaning less fatty foods, less bread, less processed junk, and eating, eating you know, real meats and vegetables and fruits and you know, natural, you know, natural, real, real stuff. That's kind of something that I've been that I've been following to an extent, and then trying to adapt into my own life. And that also goes hand in hand with what I read from Tarzan, because Tarzan was a uh, obviously the tree climber, you know. You know, in, uh, in the books, you, you read about Tarzan swinging through the middle and upper terraces of the trees, you know, and swinging on vines and things. That's influenced me to become a tree climber and to make an organization, make a community that I call Free Tree Climbing, which, which is which I like to think as a subsect of uh, of movement, as a subsect of natural movement, but also focusing on a specific aspect, which is climbing trees. And the reason I call it Free Tree Climbing is because it's climbing trees without using gear, without using harnesses, without using ropes, without using shoes and just really bringing you back to that primal state. When you climb as a, as a child would, when you look at it, kids really lead by example. The way kids do things are, uh, is the most natural way until they're told otherwise by people. <laughs> I mean, I think this is terrific. You, you've taken the, just one of the major characteristics of this Tarzan character. It has a lot to do with his fitness. And then you've taken some of these modern movements in fitness, like Move Nat, And uh, the paleo diet, uh, it sounds like you've kind of embraced that as well, although we'll get back to that in a minute. I'm interested to know if you, uh, you know, how much of that is a part of what you're doing. But you're actually creating a kind of a sport, another kind of sport based on tree (laughs) climbing. And I could just imagine uh, someday uh, there being tree races, races through the trees based on what you're doing. So you're starting this... uh, I feel funny calling it a new sport because obviously it's a flashback to a very old kind of thing that we very much did long ago in the past. But you're, you're turning this into a, a way of uh, building fitness that's very much in tune with the natural environment and maybe even our instincts. I think that's fascinating. I think that's very interesting. So so you, you obviously do this yourself. Uh, have you gotten to the point of teaching others and sharing this? Or is this something you're promoting? I, yeah, I'm always always trying to promote it, promote it more. I just I want people to get out there and to, to climb more because so many people focus on. I have so many friends that focus entirely on going, uh, you know, every day to the gym, doing these regimens, eating, you know, proteins and pills and, and creatine, all these horrible things that you should not be putting into your body. And there I am climbing trees, and they think it's they think it's weird, but I think it's fantastic. And I, I've tried promoting it in a variety of ways. So far, I've been in. Uh, I was mentioned in one magazine in, in the UK a few months ago. They were talking about it was a spread about climbing, and I got mentioned next to other free climbers like Alain Robert, who free climbs skyscrapers. He's, he's a crazy, crazy urban climber. I was also in a few documentaries recently in, in the Tarzan Centennial Celebration in Los Angeles back in uh, August. I had uh, a German film crew actually filmed me doing some free tree climbing around around the hotel and in one of the parks. Do you ever get in trouble for that? <laughs> hey, uh, you, again, kid, get out of that tree. What are you doing up there? 
Oh yeah, I get in trouble far, far more than I'd like to. <laughs> yeah, people people just don't understand. That's what I say. <laughs> that's what I'm trying to I'm trying to teach them. <laughs> you are listening to Jungle Deep. Deep. Hello, this is Dr. Jones. I believe that the destruction of the tropical rainforest is humankind's greatest environmental problem. Not climate change, not pollution, not nuclear waste, not food production, not a whole host of topics you could add to the list. I care about these things, and I have to admit that climate change and the depletion of the oceans have my particular attention. But I know that the destruction of the tropical rainforest is number one. Now, I would not be surprised if you told me that none of the people around you in your daily life are doing anything to help save the remaining tropical rainforests. We obviously have to change this situation. Many people do not take action on this issue because they're confused about what to do. Confusion breeds inaction. Well, I have a solution. Visit the Jungle Deep website and look in the directory at the top of the show homepage for my new article, called How Can I Help Save the Rainforest? It includes my five steps to saving the rainforest. It's simple, direct, clear-cut. Oh, I I probably shouldn't have used that expression. It's, uh, It's direct and it's simple. Anyone can follow these steps and everyone should. Get a copy into the hands of everyone around you. At the very least, it's a great conversation starter. And together, when there is enough of us taking action, We will save both humanity and the planet. Read and print out the list, Five Steps to Saving the Rainforest, from the Jungle Deep website. Go to calaverasgold.tv and click on Jungle Deep in the directory. This is Kelly Camille Patterson of the Velveteen Lounge Kitchen, and I make my lime jello marshmallow cottage cheese surprise while listening to Jungle Deep. Hi, I'm Al Bowl, film producer of Tars and Lord of Louisiana Jungle, and I clean my lenses while listening to Jungle Deep. Aloha, this is Marty Lush from the Tikiaki Orchestra. And when I'm not vibing with the band, I'm listening to the vibes of Ken Jones and Jungle Deep. Jungle Deep, 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 Deep. Exotic animals in their homes are what we talk about on Jungle Deep. Join biologists, zoologists, botanists, conservationists, and climatologists as they talk with me about the marvels of the tropical rainforest and how we might save them from extinction. This show is fun and one of a kind. Hi, I'm Dr. Jones, and if you love nature and her creatures like I do, join us on the podcast. Jungle Deep, 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 Deep. Hello, this is Dr. Jones. I believe the better you get to know the jungle's wonderful creatures, the more you will care about them. And as you care about them, you'll want to join with me in efforts to protect them and save them from extinction. I want to draw your attention to the Jungle Deep website and the ways I am promoting tropical rainforest education and conservation. In addition to the awesome expert guests and regular reports from our wonderful field correspondents on the podcast, I am building a website with resources to help everyone, especially students, find helpful and motivating information. One example is the new Wildlife Theater, which will contain a collection of photos and videos of exotic animals from the jungles around the world. Top-notch zoos and other conservation groups are contributing content to the Jungle Deep Wildlife Theater. You will find the Jungle Deep website by going to www.calaverasgold.tv. That's Calaveras, C-A-L-A-V-E-R-A-S, gold, G-O-L-D, like the mineral, dot TV, as in television, and clicking on Jungle Deep in the directory. Check the Jungle Deep website often because it's growing every week. Jungle Deep is a -a one-of-a-kind podcast that promotes conservation in a most entertaining way. If you want me to make more Jungle Deep episodes, let me know by making a donation to this environmental education podcast. If you would like, for a donation of $20 or more, I'll be happy to make a shout-out on the show. That's a short message about your favorite wildlife or conservation organization. You may send any amount by check mailed to me, the producer, Ken Jones, at P.O. Box 61 Murphy's, M-U-R-P-H-Y-S, California, 95247. You know, most people don't make a donation and just listen to the podcast for free. That makes your donation all the more important. The core message of Jungle Deep is that we need more people to participate in conservation. It's not enough to love nature. These days, caring about the environment absolutely requires action. 
Your action in support of this show will be used to grow Jungle Deep and to help me reach more people with our conservation message. Thank you. Now, more of Jungle Deep. Deep. Well, cool. Hey, I've I got to ask you, do you have any videos of some of your techniques, uh, some of your tree climbing? I have the Facebook page, Free Tree Climbing, and that has videos and the photographs and, uh, you know, all sorts of different media of me showing different climbing techniques. But I'm in the process of publishing my website. I've been, in the last few weeks, the last few months, been uh, trying to create a way to uh, standardize these different techniques because you can see there's different ways that people climb. There's there's the way people climb uh, coconut palms. There's the way that you climb quadrupedally up the, up the trunk of a tree. It's hard to explain without actually showing you, but that's what I've been in the process of doing, standardizing it and then making you know, so that these techniques are common knowledge, things that people can perfect, things that people can then reproduce and get better at. And, you know, those are diff- different techniques that are applicable for different kinds of trees. And so that's, that's what I've been doing. Yeah, my interest is predominantly tree climbing, but it's also, uh, it's, not, it's not limited to tree climbing. Like I said, I also do follow the, the, a lot of a lot of what Milton has does, and uh, they've been a great inspiration behind me. As a result of following that, I've done I've done not just climbing things, but I've uh, I've done other things. I've done other events to test my uh, my natural fitness. I think two years ago, I did a four mile open ocean swim when I lived in the Bahamas. Wow. I did a uh, I've done extensive barefoot running using uh, latches, the uh, minimalist sandals used by uh, used by the Tarahumara Indians, made by Luna sandals that work up in Seattle. You guys should definitely check those out. They're really cool. And then I've uh, I've also done I've done the equivalent of a barefoot marathon, and you know just just all these different things to test my natural my natural ability, my natural uh, my natural fitness, because I really believe that human beings have the capacity to do incredible things as long as they uh, as long as they do it in a natural and real way. I don't think that you're really able to test your fitness by seeing how much you can bench, but rather by seeing you know. Mm-hmm. How natural, how how real you can actually be in a in a natural in a real environment in a real world situation. Yeah, it's a practical way of applying physical fitness. At the same time, you're you're building your physical fitness. There's some free tree climbing topics, uh, of course, on the internet, and I'm wondering if have you connected with others that are doing this as well? Other other people that do free tree climbing. Yeah. Um, to an extent, yeah. There's there's several people that uh. I have some friends in Illinois that actually do uh, another form. They call it it's just barefoot tree climbing. To my knowledge and through the research I've done, I think I'm probably one of the first that's actually tried to standardize the techniques and, and teach people the different, the different ways of climbing, which is exciting, you know, because it's, it's an idea that you'd think would be just common knowledge. You know, everyone climbs trees as a kid, but no one, no one really keeps on doing it later in life. Everyone kind of stops. Well, yeah, I, I mean, obviously a lot of a lot of kids would uh, really be interested in, in this kind of thing and would be enthusiastic about it, I could imagine. It's amazing. I, I, it just never occurred to me that there would be a group of, of recreational tree climbers, and I'm seeing here on the Internet, in fact, there's a group called Tree Climbers International. So, uh, tree, climbers, tree Climbers International and the ITCC, those people, I forgot to mention them, they, they are tree climbers, but they differ, they differ from my techniques is because... Like I mentioned, the reason it's called free tree climbing is because of the lack of gear and equipment. Gear, right, right. Yeah, yeah. And they they use the gear, which, in my opinion, not not the best from them, but it doesn't it doesn't really increase one's fitness or ability in actually climbing. It's just you just hang there and you know bounce back from tree <laughs> to tree. <laughs> so there is a difference between just tree climbing and and free tree climbing. There's quite a, a dramatic difference. That's a distinction I'm trying to I'm trying to make. Yeah. Right. Right. Well, that's. Is, I think that's hard. terrific <laughs> stuff. So, uh, physical fitness is a very big part of your life. Let's talk just a minute about diet. Uh, how's it affected your diet choices? Well, you know, I, I try to stay as uh, as, as paleo as I can, but it's a uh, it's a challenge. Like I mentioned, I'm in I'm in college currently, and so you know, I'm I'm faced with uh, you know issues with loving. You're surrounded by pizzas, are you not? Exactly. <laughs> so there's always there's always the issue. You got to weigh your decisions. You know, it's either spend your money on books or spend your money on buying <laughs> on buying natural paleo things. And it's always a challenge to find them as well, because you know, some so much meat is processed, and you can buy it in uh, in stores and stuff. And you know, you don't know what's real and what's not. What is good is that I live around a community of a lot of a lot of hunters, and so what they do is we go out sometimes, and they come back with boar and quail and uh, squirrel, rabbit, all sorts of all sorts of good meat, and we uh, you know we barbecue that up sometimes, and that's, uh, that's sometimes to an extent, but it's a it's a challenge. It's it's really hard maintaining maintaining a good diet when you're at, when you're at university constantly working. <laughs> I imagine it is. 
do you ever, in fact, use the gym to augment your, your physical fitness, your training, or are you just 100% committed to natural exercise? I say you have to be 100% committed to natural exercise if you're going to preach it, except see, for the paleo yeah. diet, obviously. I haven't been to a gym since, mm -hmm. um, since mm -hmm. early in high school. Well, fun stuff. Let me ask you, because uh, anyone who's into Tarzan, because it's the centennial year for Tarzan, we're talking about Tarzan quite a bit on Jungle Deep, oh, yeah. uh, and he has, uh, as we've been discovering, been quite an influence for uh, a lot of important people in the conservation movement. We're just learning more and more about that. Uh, you're just one more that's been very much influenced uh, by Tarzan, both in your studies and in your, your physical life. And this has been really interesting to, to hear about. Do you think Tarzan has a role to play in the years ahead for the American public? Absolutely, without a doubt. The reason Tarzan was so popular, uh, just to give you a little background, it's a centennial celebration because the year that Edgar Rice Burroughs published his first book was in 1912. And 1912 was just as the United States was kind of turning into really industrialized, like really, you know, fast-paced, fast-moving, everything was like bigger and better and everything like that. And when Edgar Rice Burroughs published Tarzan, it really brought to light in the minds of a lot of Americans this reconnection with the wild, you know, with the primal instincts and, you know, the raw savage instincts with the man that people have pretty much overlooked. And in a lot of ways, that's really why it was so popularized, because people thought, you know, oh, wow, you know, I can get back into nature and I can reconnect with, you know, the animals, you know, because, because Tarzan did it. That has a lot of applicability throughout the ages, and that's the reason Tarzan has been so popular, in my opinion. You know, he's the most highly reproduced cinema character, uh, as I mentioned before. He's got, I, I think, something like 60 or 70 movies and you know, <laughs> over 100 different episodes. And That's right. Yeah, be, be, between the movies and the TV shows uh, around the world, there's been something produced about Tarzan on the average of one a year for 100 years, and you just can't say that about hardly anything else. <laughs> it's incredible, and he's had, he's had resurgences. He had resurgences. You know, it's really famous when the first movie came out, Elmo Lincoln in 1918, then again in the 30s and 40s with Johnny Weissmuller, Buster Crabb, all these characters in the 50s and 60s, and then again in the 80s and 90s. And it's it's not for now, but they're looking for a new Tarzan character for the new movie, the release to be in, I think in 20, 2013. I forget the name of the actor, but uh, there's, there's another one coming up. So I'm really I'm really hoping for another resurgence in Tarzan. And not not necessarily just another movie, but I'm really hoping for a resurgence of the books as well, because if you've seen the movies, you, you really don't know what the books are about. The books are fantastic. The books are really, uh, you know, not even comparable. We have a lot of young people listening to this podcast, and I'd point out that, uh, frankly, folks like you, people like you who are keeping this alive and spreading the word and, and developing new things from it, you're keeping Tarzan alive, too. The folks like you that are into the physical fitness and employing the move net type of physical training and diet and, and concern about, well, basically getting back to nature and respecting our own natural heritage as well as our natural environment. I think these are very important principles. And if Tarzan as a character can help interest people in these things and, and teach young people about these things, it, it's all good stuff. Absolutely. It's all good stuff. <laughs> and people, frankly, like you today are helping to do that. So I, I think it's terrific. I think it's terrific. I, I'm going to be keeping an eye on you and seeing how your career progresses and the, th <laughs> the things you're up to. I'm definitely going to be following you on Twitter. So. I appreciate it. <laughs> and, I, well, I appreciate you helping us get the word out to, to young people and people of all ages. I'm sure there's a lot of people that wouldn't take Tarzan seriously. It's a real pleasure to meet someone like you who does. I think it's, a, it's great stuff. And you don't only take them seriously, but you're, you're pursuing some of these uh, principles in your life. I think that's wonderful and fascinating and inspiring. Uh, before we, we leave, because we are out of time, but I want to ask you a couple of things having to do with the uh, tropical rainforest. You know, on this program, I try to share with people just how important the rainforests are and how they influence our daily lives. There's so many products and foods that we get from the tropical rainforest and use in our daily lives, and most people are, are just not really aware of it. And production of these things is destroying the rainforest in many places in the world. The monoculture of palm oil and bananas and production of chocolate and so so many more things that are produced in the rainforest. The rainforests have been destroyed in order to plant these crops. And there's more people on the planet all the time, so the demand for these things keeps increasing and the rainforest keeps shrinking. You've been around the world. You've been to, what did you say, 42 countries, something like that? 64, yeah. 64. <laughs> so... 
Uh, what is your perception of rainforest destruction? Is it scary out there? I know it's not all bad news, and people like your dad are, are doing some wonderful, important things to help turn it around, but it, it's, it's still kind of a, a scary situation, is it not? Tell me what, what your perception is of rainforest destruction. The thing is, I've seen, I've, I've been to quite a few rainforests, and I've seen a lot of different different kinds of destruction degradation i've seen forest fragmentation i've seen places where species once existed i've actually seen species go extinct i was uh my brother my dad and i were the last i've seen slash and burn agriculture i've seen plantations i've seen <laughs> I've, I've seen a lot i've seen a lot of destruction but at the same time i've also seen a lot of potential seen a lot of a lot of hope i've seen a lot of successful projects that have gone through, especially you know, in Conservation Central, my dad's organization. I've been in places, I've been in success stories. You know, the Central Suriname Nature Reserve, millions of hectares of preserved uh, pristine rainforest. I've been to indigenous cultures where real work with the indigenous and protection of the rainforest is work. You know, there's, there's a lot of, there's dozens of examples. There's dozens of examples of people destroying and using the rainforest incorrectly. And then there's also an equal amount of examples where things have worked. For myself, I am I am hopeful for the future, and I think that if I can do anything to inspire my generation to care more about it, that's fantastic. That's that's the life goal. If I can follow my father's footsteps and do something like that to help our planet, because I've seen the rainforest, and it's something that I definitely want my children to see and you know future generations to enjoy. My father always says that conservation is a constant struggle. It's a it's a battle, and you can't let it get you down. If you lose one battle, you can't let it get you depressed. You can't let it get get you down. You just got to keep on keep on going. Because there's no end victories, just smaller victories. You win battles here, and you can't get down if uh, if you don't win them all. But I'm I'm certainly hopeful. Yeah, is there something you would advise just average people to do to help the rainforest? What can an average person do? What do you suggest to people? Well, there's any number of things you can do. People always say do the little things that you can do. You know, following the green <laughs> the green revolution. You know, turn your lights off, a cycle. You know, buy hybrid cars, do everything like that. But People don't realize that those small things that you do actually do help a great deal on large scales. There's other obvious things that you shouldn't do. Some places are really heavily exploited. You know, don't if you go on vacation, don't don't buy bush meat products. Don't buy things that are going to perpetuate negative behaviors in uh, in those cultures. You're saying pay real attention to what you consume. Absolutely. And and where that where those products come from and how they're how they're generated. Well, here on Jungle Deep, I do still preach, because I, I started out doing this quite a few years ago, <laughs> the three R's, reduce, recycle, and reuse. Those are things that most people can still do more of. Absolutely. I kind of wrestle with that every day. I'm trying to find ways to, to practice those three R's a little better than maybe I used to. I think that's important for everyone to do, and getting informed. And I think, frankly, environmental devastation that has been happening for a long time. We have been consuming our environment far more than protecting it, and it's dangerous what we're doing. And I think inspiring others to, to learn more about these things and to adopt an environmentally friendly lifestyle as much as they can is, is important. So th those are things I'd like to bring up is, is the good old three R's and share this news, this information with other people and get more people Frankly, we need more people involved in the environmental movement to make the changes and push for the changes that we need to have happen through our political systems and our corporate structures. I've seen the environment be a lot more popular as a concern and a topic and a priority for the American public. I've seen that in the past and then I've seen it wane. And I, as I've said before, I think we're in a recession of environmental consciousness right now and we need to bring it back and it needs to not be taking the back seat in our lives. It's got to be first and foremost. It comes before everything else. Yeah, it absolutely does. We are a part of the environment. People have, people have that inclination to think that we're separate, a separate entity from the environment. What people really need to understand is that we are, we are a part of it and everything we do to it, we do to ourselves. We'll need to focus and take that absolutely 100% more seriously. Yeah, it's not an option. <laughs> Environmentalism is not an option. It's, it's really not. It's a priority. Anyway, you've helped to communicate all of that today. You've said one of the things you care most about is inspiring others, and you've certainly done that today. So it's been my pleasure to talk with you. I look forward to talking to you again. I hope we can get you to come back to Jungle Deep and tell us about some of your latest adventures. I hope so. Thank you very much for sharing all this stuff with us today. I, I really appreciate it. Thank you. Be sure to share Jungle Deep Podcast with your friends and co-workers. 
This show is my creation and at my personal expense. It is not currently subsidized by any business or organization. Audience growth is especially important for Jungle Deep to succeed and prosper. So share the show. You can see beautiful photos and learn more about Jungle Deep at our website, calaverasgold.tv. Now that's Spanish, calaveras, C-A-L-A-V-E-R-A-S, gold, G-O-L-D, like the mineral, dot TV, like television. You gotta check it out. Where else can you go for this kind of fun? Just click on the Jungle Deep title in the header directory. Our show notes pages have valuable links for you. I invite you to email me at jungledeep at calaverasgold.tv and follow me on Twitter. Search for Jungle Deep or Ken Jones 56 all one word. I would love to hear your ideas for the show. Well, the show's over for today, so it's time to refill my Mai Tai, mount my elephant, and head back into the jungle. 